where you saw on a Thursday morning, and it's an opportunity for business people who have a Facebook page to come, get a little showcase about their business in 30 seconds, and then they flash up your Facebook page. I forget the name of the lady's name, Joanna, but she was the whole group would evaluate the Facebook page and what could be done differently to make it more interesting and more out of succeed at social media. I was sitting at Tom one day and you started talking about what you do and that was a year ago and that was the last time I saw Tom other than on Facebook. So I'm kind of surprised that he even knew what I did. But anyway, this morning we have a guest speaker. His name is Tom Ray. Tom works for Radio Yakima, a company out of Canada. He's a graduate from the L.A. State School of Diploma. He was born and raised in Canada. He works for, he he's worked in radio for 35 years, and he's done many formats in radio. Currently, he works at Sirius FM, Group Grace, and the Valley Radio. Tom will be speaking on vocal variety. Please <coughs> welcome Tom Ray. <laughs> I remember talking to Kathy. I just, I honestly, I did not remember what you looked like. So, and I looked on your Facebook page, and still don't know what you. Why? Well, I know now, but <laughs> I didn't at the time. I, if I, if I seem a little nervous today, that's because I'm used to doing public speaking. I do I do public speaking every day. I just never do it in public. <laughs> because I work in radio, so uh, I, I, I do that. Uh, and in my background, I was telling Kathy that, uh, you know, I was in drama club and the advanced choir in school, basically the glee club, and uh, performing choirs. I took guitar lessons where they insisted we get out in front of people. So I've had a lot of experience being in front of people, but I think uh, one of the things I learned that I it's kind of good to get butterflies before you start talking because butterflies make you concentrate. You know you really have to concentrate on what you're doing uh, when you're doing public speaking. So, uh, oh, did you, uh, uh, sidebar for a second, did you hear the story about the two guys from Mapton that were in a restaurant up here in Yakima and a lady started choking on her dinner? And she was just going on, and the guy, one guy got up, he says, I'm going to take care of this. He jumps over to her, he uh, grabs her, lifts up her skirt, puts his tongue on her hiney, and she's so shocked by this, she coughs up the food. So she sits down, she's coughing, she's still uh, shocked that this gentleman had done that. And uh, he uh, says, you okay, ma'am? She says, uh-huh. And, and it's, he says, all right. And he goes back over to his friend. He says, you know, as many times as I heard about that Heinlich maneuver, I never thought it would work. <laughs> yeah. But I digress. So um, at, when I went to L.H. Bates Vocational Technical Institute in Tacoma, that was back in the day when you had to have a license to work in radio. Nowadays, the government doesn't care. <laughs> if, if somebody's going to hire you and put you on the air, you don't need to have a, what it, we used to have the third class, second class, or first class license, but you had to take a federal test to get a license to work in broadcasting. I uh, got my third class license with what they called a broadcast endorsement, which allowed me to uh, read meters, because if you didn't, have the test and see back when I took the test that a lot of people say I don't look this old but when I took the test they didn't allow us to use calculators we could only use slide rules mm -hmm. to calculate uh, we had to calculate output power and antenna resistance and other things like that so it was, it was quite an education and yeah, I got a diploma they don't even have the radio class at my school anymore that they completely uh, banned that not banned it but uh, disbanded the, the whole program in Tacoma. So after years of working in uh, basically a transient uh, business, radio is with DJs, you get a job and the format runs its course and then 
some new owner comes in and buys it, or they decide, well, we're not getting the ratings we want with the format we're doing, so we'll change the format. Well, unfortunately, you don't fit this format anymore, so bye, and you go to another station. So in my years in radio, I've worked at KJR in Seattle and KLSY and, um, uh, oh, gee, KJ, uh, KJazz and uh, KYAC, which was the R&B station there, and KTAC in Tacoma, and, you know, I've just been in a lot of places. And you know, you'd look at the resume and think, well, oh, this guy, this guy can't keep a job. No, that, that's just the way the industry is. If you want to make more money, well, you want to jump to the next station to, you know, to improve yourself. So after years of struggling on the west side, uh, working a few years in uh, Portland, and also ending up as the uh, director of instruction for broadcast schools down there, I ended up back in Seattle. Uh, things weren't going too well for me over in Tacoma. My parents had passed away, so I basically couldn't live in the basement anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, a friend of mine, actually a student of mine from my Portland school, says, hey, Tom, you ever done mornings before? And I said, yeah. He says, you want to go to Yakima? I said, and exactly where is that? <laughs> and so yeah, lo and behold, I packed up my, my little green truck and drove over here in 97 and have been here ever since. So that's how I come to Yakima. Uh, I began working for <laughs> it's, uh, Town Square Media now. But when I first started working for it, I even forget who the owner was then. Oh, it was, uh, um, um, oh, you see, uh, some folks get Alzheimer's. I get some timers. <laughs> so I, I forget the names of things occasionally. Uh, and uh, this one company owned it, then they sold it to Gap Broadcasting, and then Gap Broadcasting sold it to Town Square Media, which is who owns the company where Brian Teagarden works. Yeah, that's uh, KIT and uh, uh, 107 FFM and uh, CATS. Th they own all those stations. My company owns uh, KXDD, Cherry FM, Hot 99.7, KBBO, uh, The Tractor, and uh, so that's, that's where we all are there, and that's where I am now. Uh, and like I said, just in the, the middle of all the stuff where everybody was getting laid off, the, uh, I was one of those people and uh, was unemployed for two years. That's how Kathy met me, because I had plenty of time to go to those meetings, <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't have a job. So uh, that finds us here before you all. And the question for me was vocal uh, inflection, theatrics is what I like to call it. You remember those old movies? I think the movie was uh, about Gypsy Lee Ray, if anybody remembers who she was, the famous burlesque star. And back in those days of vaudeville, they would have what they called stage moms. And they, they would have, a, oh, you know, there was auditions for little kids. So they'd bring the child up to the director, and the mother would be standing right there. Okay, Johnny. Okay, Johnny. Show him what you can do. Show him happy. <laughs> Show him sad. You know, and the child would have to go through those things. Well, when you're speaking to people, you don't have the physical method of showing them. It, well, you, you do if you're here on stage, if you have things. But in my profession, I have to show happy and I have to show sad with my voice. And that's what I hope that all of you can achieve when you're speaking about something that's joyful, that you can sound happy and joyful about it. Or if it's serious, and desperate or sad, then you can put that type of emotion into your voice and when you're reading. One of the best things that I used to help me work, work on my inflection was emulating other people. Because when I got into radio and found out that I have to work with my voice, but in order to make an effective commercial, I have to be able to bring that vocal theatrics out. I have to be able to 
let a person know if this is a happy event or if there's something sad but then I have to be happy about it at the end I have to be able to do that so one of the things I used was listening to other commercials I would people would say oh turn it the commercial no I want to hear that I want to hear the commercial because I want to see how the announcer says that so I can try to emulate what he says when I'm doing my work or if I do something close to that then that's how I developed my speaking ability, at least my broadcast voice. Uh, a lot of people, they, they meet me for the first time and uh, they say, oh, you're black. And I say, why, yes I am. <laughs> and I say, but you don't talk black. <laughs> and I said, well, exactly how does black talk? Because I'm black and this is the way I've always talked. <laughs> so, I have to tell them how I was raised. Uh, my mother and father met in 1947 at Fort Lewis. They were both in the Army. And um, my mother's from Louisiana. My father's from Texas. My mother, her family, has, uh, they're a lot of college-educated folks. Uh, I had a uh, uh, uncle who is a uh, music professor, not anymore, he's long gone but a music professor down in Louisiana, uh, college educated. Um, my mother did not go to college because she, uh, what happened to her in her young age, which I'm sure a lot of young women back in the 30s and 40s didn't want to happen to them, she had a child out of wedlock. And that was a very shameful thing, and of course she had to, she disappeared wasn't in Louisiana anymore. She was in Denver with Uncle Johnny. <laughs> and uh, so um, my oldest sister uh, uh, was from that relationship that uh, she had actually, my sister, what, where she's like uh, six years older than me, so she's 66 years old and uh, about five or six years ago just met her birth father, who's still alive and kicking. Um, so my mother because of the time living in the Northwest, uh, African Americans believed that if they spoke the King's English without too much colloquialism in their voice, they would get ahead in life. It wasn't necessarily true, but that's how they felt back in the late 40s, early 50s. So my mother was determined that I didn't speak any jive or be rhyming and timing, hey, what's up, what's happening, baby? You know what's going on, yeah, I like what you're doing. And my mother would say, you don't say that, you don't speak like that, you don't talk like that. My mother and I once had an argument about the word just. I was saying, oh, you know, that's just because the guy was down, the seat, that, what's the word? Just, no, just, just, J-U-S-T, just. That's how my mother was with me. We're watching TV, and President Kennedy's giving a speech, and he says, just America. And my mother, I said, Mom, see, even the president says just. And, of course, the common response that a parent would give is that the president doesn't live here. <laughs> so you need to speak the language the way it's supposed to be spoken. So I have always, I just grew up that way, that, that you don't, speak out of slang, you speak the king's English, that's the way it is, you know, and that's the way it will be. So I was raised that way. I, I was uh, sometimes even ostracized by African Americans for not sounding like I was from the hood, because I wasn't. I mean, I was raised a, a middle class child. I, you know, had my car at 16, and I, there was a, a government program to give minorities jobs, and I couldn't get it because both my parents worked for, uh, they worked at Fort Lewis, they worked in the military for years. My father did 12 years in the Army, he got a medical discharge and went to the same vocational school I did, Bates, which also had a, a carpentry program, studied there and then went back to Fort Lewis as a post engineer where he worked for another 30 years. My mother went to uh, the Tacoma Cosmetology School, was the first African American woman to graduate from that school. Uh, she did hair at home for a while. That business wasn't working. 
went back to Fort Lewis, worked at Madigan Army for like 29 years, uh, the Army Hospital there. So both my parents military, uh, me basically raised m m middle class, uh, a as it were. So that too, and the fact that we lived in a community where I was like one of seven African American children in my elementary school, one of 40 in my junior high school, and one of about 125 in my high school, <coughs> which, by the way, was Lincoln High School in Tacoma, which is celebrating its 100th anniversary at this time. But uh, uh, so I, I was in, I, I don't, don't really like to say a white environment all the time, but I, you know, the, the majority of the people in my community, in my youth, were, were Caucasian. So that's how I was raised. Uh, this is how I speak, and you know, I, I, I guess I got the Eddie Haskell treatment because I was the black guy who had the good diction. <laughs> so, you know, parents weren't so alarmed or threatened when I came over and was able to say, why, that's a nice dress you have on, Mrs. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm very happy to be here, very happy to be in your home. So, uh, there we go. Now, back to vocal theatrics. So, the stage mom is telling the child, you know, show happiness, show sadness, and that's what you should do. Listen to other people. Listen to other announcers on radio and TV and see if you can not emulate the voice. Now, the way to do that is to get a recorder. I don't know how many of you have recorders, whether they be cassette, which uh, at this day and age, cassettes are Neanderthal technology. Um, uh, to a re recording program in your computer, something that you can record yourself. You will listen back to yourself. When you hear your voice, you will say, I don't sound like that. That's not my voice. Yes, it's your voice. But here's the difference. Standing here talking to you, my mouth is in front of my ears. And not only do I hear what I'm saying, but I feel what I'm saying because you feel the vibration of your vocal cords. When you take the, take the voice, turn it around and aim it at you, and take away the feeling you have, why, you sound different. You sound like what everybody else hears you sounding like. So don't be surprised when you play yourself back, listen to yourself, that you say, oh wow, I sound so different than I do. Well, that, that's what's gonna happen. So work on the vocal theatrics. Find a theme uh, in your next few talks where you're gonna be talking about something that's uh, not very happy, not very pleasing, but a subject that you need to speak about seriously so that you can get that. And now, not to be sexist, I would like to talk to ladies about excitement. Because the human listening is also based on frequency. And what I mean by that is sound is a vibrating, it's a vibration. The human hearing range is from 88 on the low end to 1600, 1500 cycles per second on the high end. So in between those ranges, Humans listening is better at the low end than it is at the high end. But women, uh, uh, I feel, like I said, sexist about saying this, but when women get excited, sometimes they talk like this and it's higher. Because I'm not a girl, I don't have that really high voice, but women have a pitch that people can't listen to. And everybody knows Darth Vader. And when Darth Vader speaks, you listen to what he says, because you are my son, I am your father. You know, that deep voice resonates within us all. And every woman has the alto voice. She has an alto in her voice, and you need to learn how to control that. So when you're going excited, you don't go over the top and you're way right up there. You know, and uh, you'll listen to some women on radio, and I'm not going to name names, but you'll listen to some women who are on radio, and when they're doing that happy, excited thing, they're like, Pew! you know, 
The national commercials, when you hear a national commercial, it's not pronounced, pronounce, uh, produced like uh, by a small city or something. The national, you'll hear those women, they still have a good voice. I think the highest voice uh, on the radio is the um, grocery outlet girl. Um, I can't remember the name of the character, but she has sort of a high-pitched voice uh, that's doing uh, the sales there. But uh, for most part, I would try to recommend to women to look for that alto in your speaking voice when you're doing that. And um, the other thing for me, too, is like uh, I have discovered, uh, 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 I'm sure a lot of you don't think I am, at least I'm hoping that a lot of you don't think I am, I just turned 60 October the 5th. <coughs> so I am discovering that I need glasses <laughs> to read, and not only that, I, I sometimes will do this with my reading glasses. I make a bifocal bifocal <laughs> that helps me, helps me read my scripts and stuff. If I don't do this, sometimes I really can't see. And I know, I, see, because I was unemployed for two years, I hadn't gone to the eye doctor. I just got insurance there. I thought I was going to be on Obamacare by now, but <laughs> the website didn't work. <laughs> so. Uh, no, I have insurance now, so I can go see the eye doctor and, 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 and get that taken care of. But having these bifocal bifocals give me a, a better look at this. The font I like is 22. That's a, that's a big font, but uh, like I said, at, at this age, that big font helps me see the script and helps me see the commas and periods that are very important to what you're reading. Uh, uh, missing a, a comma or a period can actually change the meaning, as you well know, uh, of what you're reading. So make sure you see that. So Kathy has asked me to uh, read the introduction for uh, Deborah Hoon Yates. Kuhn. Crone. Thank you. Yates. I'm, you know, that's the worst, that's the one thing that's always killed me in, in what I do is names. And what I'm doing in radio now is I'm doing, I do a radio show, I'm a DJ, and play the music and everything, but I, I'm also, they have me doing the news in the morning. And that's the one thing that kills me, is these names of people from other countries. <laughs> well, even from people from America, for that matter, uh, uh, seeing the names. So a lot of times, I'll be smart and just skip by the name. You know, the Secretary General of France Instead of, you know, it says John Smith of France, so I uh, drop that because I can't pronounce it, you know. And uh, so I'll, I'll do a little editing, but that's radio stuff. That's not for speaking. Uh, you know, if you're uh, reading a teleprompter or reading your script, uh, it, it, it's important to, to know the pr correct pronunciations of names. So we're g doing this introduction here, and she wanted to hear me do it as opposed to how she did it. So I will see if I can... Uh, do this some justice. Sometimes in our Toastmasters Club, we're asked to assume a role of speaker, and today we're asked to consider ourselves members of an audience to enjoy an after-dinner program. Our next speaker spent her childhood on a large farm in a rural community of Royal Slope, playing with Barbie dolls and Tonka trucks. Today, she lives in Terrace Heights, uh, let's try that again. Today she lives in Terrace Heights and plays with rakes, hoes, and pruning shears. Speaking from the Specialty Speeches Manual, Project 2, Uplift the Spirit, help me welcome Deborah Kroon Yates. If only I then knew what I know now. Deborah Kroon Yates. Did I'm saying that Kroon right? Kroon. Kroon. And I keep putting the oom on it. So... Although I did have a, a stumble in there on the thing, but uh, I tried to put some inflection in it. Uh, putting the period at the end of, uh, it says, the role for our speaker. And you have to put those pauses in the right place. If you flow through those sentences, it doesn't, you're not getting the meaning of it. You know? So when you come to that, assume the role for speaker. Today, you see how I, today, uh, drop it down, because I didn't want to go, today, <laughs> and uh, you have to be careful of, of doing things like that so that your inflections aren't going all over the place and everything. 
I think one of the problems that we as Americans have, and I, I guess they probably do this everywhere, is we learned how to read Dick and Jane or any book in school. But we were taught to read, see Dick run, Dick runs fast, 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 fast. <laughs> and so we were taught to read like this, and that is how some people talk when they are doing speeches, but that is not proper. And so once again, you have to kind of let yourself get into it, flow through it, and sell it. It's just as much of a, 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 a show, a performance, your speech is, as it is you reading something. So you have to think about it that way. Um, like I said, now, today, I mean, if I had a teleprompter, if I had to read, you know, and write out speeches, which I have, uh, anybody in here I uh, a Mormon? I have been a member of the Mormon church since 1980. I know that's a surprise. Uh, <laughs> the Lord was surprised, too. But <laughs> um, in the Mormon church, everybody speaks. Everybody speaks. They have youth speakers. They have adult speakers. You join the church in a couple of months, they're going to be asking you, okay, I would like you to give a talk on X. And you stand at a podium in the church during the service, and you're the featured speaker and you're up there, and you got to be ready to go, you know. Uh, not that anybody's going to be judgmental on you, but you better know your scriptures, you better have them in there, and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. I've seen people <coughs> where they come up and they're not sure where they're going, you know. The chapter, Matthew, chapter, and uh, you, you, you're taught to get organized. I'm not saying join the Mormon church just to be a speaker. But <laughs> I'm saying that you would understand how important that is. And basically, with the youth speakers, their, their whole game plan is that they get those young kids used to being up in front and speaking. And so when they're old enough to go on a mission, if they're qualified, then they're ready to talk. They've had years of their youth publicly speaking about their topic, so they're ready to go. So Toastmasters is great because they're basically doing the same thing for each and every one of you. You're learning how to do that. But uh, look, I, I would imagine you'd look for any opportunity to give a speech, you know, in, in where, wherever you can. Uh, it helps if you're, you're running for office. Of course, the most important thing is um, um, uh, Ron Paul. Um, uh, he's in a little, is it Ron or his son? son the son is Ron. Ran. Ran. The son is Ran. Is in a little trouble for uh, plagiarizing. He, uh, he has been making speeches and not attributing the fact that he's getting these speeches off of Wikipedia, which is, I think, the worst place to get a speech <laughs> because anybody and their mama can write whatever they want up there. But they have busted him several times reading verbatim from his teleprompter a speech or, or a description of something that is word for word from Wikipedia. Make sure you attribute credit to those you're speaking, especially if you're speaking in a big public place where everybody can, can see you uh, because you, the copyright laws are really strict, very strict. We were doing website post at the other station, and uh, they, they <coughs> told us we had to put a website post up every day. And one day I copied and pasted something and didn't get permission to do such. And uh, boy, it really came down on me because whoever I got that from called my boss, who called my supervisor, and they said, what are you doing? You can't do that. You know, it's just really important that if you're taking lines and phrases from somebody say that so-and-so said that and make sure that you don't. I see yellow card means I have five more minutes. I am not sure if I need to take five more minutes. What I would like to do is give folks uh, an opportunity to ask me questions. We can do that. Is there anybody that has a question? Yes, ma'am. This sort of has philosophical 
calling emotion as it's speaking. Mm -hmm. And I'm working on a project where I need to read a book. And I find the book, it's a children's book, I find it emotional. Mm -hmm. And is there a trick, a technique, so you don't, I'm sure you don't break down crying on the radio when you're talking <laughs> yeah. about something. But is there a trick, you know, to, to say something? I oh, you want to cry. No, I don't want to cry. Oh, you don't want to cry. <laughs> Excellent suggestion. I, you know, I, you're, but you're reading it to kids. Well, it's a project for Toastmasters. I'll be reading yeah. it to adults. Okay. I say, you know, you can get through it without really falling down on the floor and kicking your legs crying. <laughs> then leave the crying in. I think one of the most uh, impactful speeches I have ever heard was from... Um, Oh, shoot. What's his name? Um, um, the guy that sells gold. Um, and he has a talk show that nobody likes him anymore. They used to all like him, and now he's... What? Well, he's on TV. He has a yeah. talk show, but they took him off of Fox. No, no, not Jose. Uh, it, 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 he's uh, a white male, uh, very, very right-wing Republican. Like Alex? Jones? No. Um, um, oh man, this guy was on Fox, very, very popular. Nowadays, he's kind of relegated mm -hmm. to just doing his radio show. Um, but he gave a speech at the Children's Miracle Network convention I was at in Florida. And he was telling the story about how his daughter has a debilitating disease. And he was absolutely in tears but he was able to get his words out with those tears in his eyes and the emotion in his voice he was able to speak it clearly and it was the most emotional talk I had ever heard you know I think that I wasn't a person in the audience who didn't want to run up and uh, give the guy a hug and I'll think of his name after I'm driving down the road but I'm just <laughs> like some timers <laughs> Uh, oh, yeah, I'll put it on Facebook. There you go. But um, I hope that each of you can, can try the things that I've suggested. Uh, one is to listen to other people. Two is to record yourself and, and listen back. And three is to find things to talk about that would bring tears to your eyes. You know, or hilarious stories that you want to share with, with people. Not the Heimlich maneuver <laughs> jokes, <laughs> but any of those. And uh, attempting those three things and, and working on putting theatrics into your voice will help you succeed in adding more drama to your deliver delivery and making you a much more memorable speaker. I want to thank you for uh, inviting me, Kathy, and the rest of you. Thank you for uh, giving me some time. Thank you very much.